Well, I hope I'm not being too repetitious, too redundant. Uh, but uh, I feel it's really important as we read through Second Timothy that we always keep in mind the idea of Paul being a man who is sentenced to die. He's a we, what they call a dead man walking. I mean, he is condemned, his fate is sealed, and there is no way that he's going to escape this other than a very profound, miraculous intervention by the hand of God. And yet Paul seemed to understand and be resolved to the fact that that wasn't going to happen, that he knew within himself that his time to go home to be with the Lord had arrived. And that's why he's saying to Timothy, you know, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't pull back. Don't be afraid to continue to share your faith with other people for fear of the consequences of doing that. And he says, and don't be ashamed of me. In other words, don't get in the place where you don't people tell people you don't know me. Remember how Peter denied that he knew the Lord three times. That's because Peter had become ashamed of Jesus. Jesus was arrested. Jesus was condemned. Uh, Jesus was tortured. Jesus was executed. And Peter became so afraid that the same thing would happen to him that he began to deny the Lord. In a sense, that's what it means to be ashamed of God, that we are embarrassed or we're afraid to express our faith because we don't want people to think negatively of us and more significantly to do negative things towards us and against us. People are afraid, you know, I'll lose my job, I'll lose my friendships, my relationships. And I think the relationship probably is the biggest thing that we fear because all of us fear being alone. And that's why we live in a culture where basically they try to threaten you uh, with loneliness if you don't comply with their mandates and with their lockdowns and their requirements, whatever they put on you. And many people are afraid to stand up and just simply say, no, I'm not going to do that. I have a conscience towards God, simply because they're afraid of the consequences. They're afraid of being isolated. Think about how the fear of being canceled is so profound in many people's mind. Uh, I had one pastor mention me the other day, based upon the things that I share, uh, he says, I can't believe you haven't been canceled yet. And uh, I thought to myself, I said, well, yeah, I've kind of expected to be canceled for some time, and I haven't been, and maybe it's just I'm just not significant enough for them to worry about. But the long and the short of it is that whatever happens, happens. I mean, it's, it's, it's in God's hands. It's not in my hands, and so I'm not going to worry about it. Now, I won't say I haven't been threatened by some of the media organizations, um, and, I, and I wouldn't say that they haven't pulled some of my stuff, but be that as it may, I don't live to please them. I don't even live to please you as the audience, if you will. I live to please the Lord. And I just want to be faithful to speak the truth in love and say it like it is. Because one of the things that Paul said, you have to understand that the reason we're not ashamed of the gospel and we're not ashamed of those who suffer for the gospel is because he, it, Paul said he is, in verse 9, has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Now, being called to a holy life, saved for and called to a holy life. Um, the word holiness kind of gets a bad rap. I mean, we have a way of understanding it. And I, I think that probably um, it's not totally unjustified. The idea of living a holy life means you're living a life that is separate, a life that is sanctified to God. I mean, literally, that's what the word holy means, a life that is devoted to God. And when you think about the Christian life, you have to understand that there are three stages that our life is going to go through as a child of God. The first one is that we're going to be justified by faith. That's an instantaneous experience. In other words, when I asked Christ into my heart, God declared me uh, not guilty. He basically acquitted me. I wouldn't say that I was innocent because I was a sinner saved by grace. I'm not innocent, but I have been acquitted of those things for which I deserve eternal judgment. And so that means that God came and he justified me and as a result, instantaneously released me from the judgment of hell and death because of my sin. But what follows is a lifelong process, and that's called sanctification. And some people have tried to uh, convince people that sanctification happens immediately. In other words, you're pure and perfect without sin, and you can never be tainted by it ever again. The simple fact is that sanctification is this idea of separating myself from things that aren't of God. And that's a lifelong process. It's a daily process. Sometimes it can be an hour-by-hour -hour process. Because it involves that constant 
thinking of things through the lens of Scripture and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we decide that there are some things that we cannot do or will not do or should not do, and we choose to go a different direction. We choose to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. The way I like to put it is that the most oft-repeated command of Jesus in the Gospels was simply, follow me. And if I'm following him, I'm going to avoid being in places that I don't want to be. And that's where it really becomes critical, because I mentioned recently the difference between being in relationship with God and being in fellowship with God. I think there is a distinction that when I became justified, I immediately entered into a relationship. I was adopted into the family of God, and I became pure and spotless. It, basically, Paul said in Ephesians that we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So the moment I asked Christ into my life, I became saved, and I became completely saved. And as uh, one great saint put it, he says, if eternal life isn't eternal, then I don't know what it is. So what I experienced that moment was the residence of the Holy Spirit inside of me. He came inside of my heart, I, my body became the temple of the Holy Ghost, and I became saved. And I was justified, declared, acquitted, and freed from all of my past sins. He removed them as far as the east is from the west, as it says in Psalm 103. So also, but what happened is I began to enter into this point of, now am I going to follow Jesus on a daily basis? And that's where I think that the fellowship part comes in, because I have this relationship where I'm sealed in the beloved for eternity, but whether or not I'm walking in fellowship with God and experiencing His, His voice in my life is a different thing, because there are places that if I go to, I know that I'm going there alone. God is not leading me. I'm going in that place. I'm going in a direction. He says, I'm not going to go there. And so what I learned by experience is to choose to follow him where he leads me. Because I've had those moments in my life where I realized that I haven't heard the voice of God. There's kind of like this deafening silence, whereas I, before I would open the word, I'd feel God speaking into my heart, and I'd be so enriched by that time with God. I'd go to church, and God would just speak to my life, and I would obey God in some area. And after I had done what he had directed me to do, I felt this sense of, peace and satisfaction and fulfillment that I have been perfectly aligned with what He wanted for me. Even though I am imperfect, He has this ability to perfectly align us with His will when He chooses to do so. And so I, I love those moments, and I know those other times where I decide, well, I know I shouldn't, but I'm going to do this anyway. And you feel that, that silence. And the longer you stay there, uh, the more deafening the silence becomes until it becomes unbearable. It's You begin to realize, you begin to feel the presence of evil around you and how it's beginning to really start to take your life captive. And it's at those points where we need to step back and say, Lord, forgive me, and I'm just going to commit myself to following you, and I'm not going to disobey you uh, again as long as I have the presence of mind not to do so. So I know this isn't really easy, and I don't want to make say it's a one-time thing or it's a simple thing. It's a daily thing, an hourly thing. And I think very, by the very fact that we're doing this right now, that you've made a decision that I want to hear from God. I want to hear from God. When you pick up your Bible, you're making a decision saying, I want to hear from God. The only thing that keeps you from hearing God is unrepentant sin in your life. So if you're harboring bitterness, resentment, lust, envy, you know, with things we call the secret sins that other people can't see, but God sees very clearly, if we don't confess those things, they become they begin to cause a dissonance in our conversation with God. He doesn't completely cut you off automatically, but you begin to find that he feels more and more distant. You can't hear him as clearly. And what happens is your ears become stopped with your own transgressions. And so when we confess our sins, it's almost like the plugs pop out of our ears and suddenly we can hear clearly. I remember when my mother was wanting me to spend $5,000 to get her a hearing aid and I, and I said, said to her, well, uh, rather than just going down to this department store where they did a test on you, let me take you to an ENT who can do some in-depth examination. And I remember it was so funny because she went in there and the doctor looked at her, he looked in her ears and so forth. And then he pulled out a little tool and he reached out and he he pulled out a wad of thick, dry, hard, solid wax. And all of a sudden, my mom said, what's that sound? 
she could hear the music in the background. <laughs> and it had always been playing, but she had her ear plugged with this obstacle that was keeping her from hearing the sound that everybody else could hear. And I'm just saying that that happens to us when we allow things in our life that we know aren't pleasing to God. What happens is there's a, there's a deafness uh, that comes into our life. We no longer have the same kind of ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us. Let me assure you, the Holy Spirit isn't seeking to be silent. He wants to speak in your life on an ongoing, a constant way, and He speaks to you in a variety of different ways. But when you find yourself in a place where you just don't see God, you don't hear God, you don't recognize Him, the problem may be with you because you've chosen not to live a holy life. Now, I said there's one more last part. There's justification. Sanctification was last in my entire life. Just in case, case, justification is instantaneous. Sanctification is a lifelong process. But the last one is glorification. And that's an instantaneous experience as well. It's when you transition from this earthly presence into the presence of God. And that's really called, caused by death itself or the rapture if it comes first. So that becomes the moment where we become glorified and the fighting of everyday conflict ends and we enter into his presence. We become, we receive a new body which is basically congruent with the very nature of God so that we no longer sin. Well, we'll continue on as we continue to talk a little more about this grace of God. God bless you.